Today we'll be preaching on the good, the bad, and the ugly truth. And our main text will be Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. And so the Word of God says, And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived, and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Let's start off with a word of prayer. God, my Father, I, I ask for that precious blood of yours, Lord. I, I pray that you wash away any errors or any sin I may have in my heart, Lord, residing in there, Lord. I pray that that blood that's able to save to the uttermost, Lord, would now wash the iniquity from me, Lord. And I'm nothing but a broken vessel, Lord. I'm, I'm afraid to preach to your people now, Lord, but I know you didn't give me the spirit of fear, Lord, so I ask you set me aside, Lord. You set my little feelings aside, Lord, and you hide me behind Calvary, Lord that you could preach to these people, Father, and that they'll get something out of it, Lord, and just do something for these people here, Lord. I trust that you are, Lord, and I thank you for doing something for these people, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Oh, so my first point today will be, right, on Adam, the good, right? So we see Adam being the first righteous person. So in Hebrews we're told, uh, that he was righteous, right? And we, are, we also know that Cain is the bad. He was of that wicked one, right? And he did end up killing his brother as the story goes on here, right? So we'll see first the good, the first righteous person and the first wicked person. Well, as we first look at Abel, we see that he was a keeper of the sheep, right? So he was a keeper of the sheep. He had his eyes on the sheep, on what they were doing, on how things were going for them, whereas his brother, so the righteous had his eyes on the sheep, the wicked had his eyes on the ground, on the land, right? And if we know the story, what had happened in Genesis 3, the land was cursed. The land was cursed because of sin, and we were not supposed to eat of it, right? Well, we were supposed to work that land, right? And so although he was tilling it, he had his eyes on it, right? And so when it came to giving something to God, one of them was looking for the lamb, and one of them was looking at something cursed, right? And so, of course, what happened, right? The one who's looking at the cursed things, right? The lust of the eyes, right? Of course, that person reaps some negativity, right? He, his countenance fell, right? Meaning his, his, his face went from being happy to fallen, right? To a, a, a sad state, right? And so... We see that's the difference. The first main difference between the righteous and the wicked is one is looking towards the Lamb, the Lamb of God, who taketh away the sin of the world, who is Jesus Christ. And another one is looking towards cursed things. Another one is waking up in the morning and turning towards their iPhone. And one, of us, one of them is waking up and they are right away want to hear some gossip. Right away they want to hear what's going on at the breakfast table. Or the other ones, they're waking up and saying, man, God, I don't even know how to wake myself up. You woke me up. Right? I love talking to Muslims and stuff because they pray so many times before they even lay the leave the bed, you know? And if there's something we could learn from all these other we need to be more devout, right? We need to keep our eyes on, on, on the Lamb from the very second we wake up, right? From the very second we wake up because everything else is cursed. This is cursed ground we're on, folks, right? There, anything else we're looking at is going to be cursed, right? So you keep, you keep following this. Abel, well, I guess we'll start off with, with Cain. Cain was the first one to give, right? He was the first one to be righteous, or to be, right, quote-unquote righteous, religious, right, pious. And he was the first one to come to God, right, and give 
right, what he wanted, right? Give the cursed things that although God had said, thou shalt not eat, right? And, and, and that's in uh, uh, Genesis 3. He said, thou would not eat of the land. And he tries to give something that we're not even supposed to be eating, giving it to God, giving it up to God, right? And may not, maybe he didn't even realize of what he was actually doing, but he still tried to come to God his way. Yeah. Whereas, his, whereas his brother, he was the second to come. Maybe he just seen his other brother being religious, got under conviction, said, man, I need to go give something to the Lord too. And he, but, but he, as, the, as a sinner, right, just like the, the, the man who looked down instead of the Pharisee looking up towards God, he went and did it God's way and gave the firstlings and the fat thereof, right? Are you the one who is pious and the first one to go agree to help out and do something and then you're complaining about it? Or are you the one who's, who's there giving every bit of it even if no one asked you? Maybe if pastor had to come to you, can you throw out the trash? Maybe one of us who's not even in a, a real... I'm not a leader in this church, you know, maybe one of us, we come and ask you, you know, and it's not like, oh, well, who is he to, you know, tell me that, you know, it's, not, it's none of that, you know, it's, it's none of that, it's just the firstlings and the fat thereof. If you know anything about Leviticus, you know the fat is a sweet savor to the Lord. The Lord likes the fat, he likes the fat. Hey, we just had a good meal. I got a little fat on me. I got a little fat on me, right? We, and I'm not, talking about the, I'm not talking about that, I'm talking about that sermon this morning. Right? Where was your eyes in that, huh? You see what I'm talking about? When I said that right now, were you thinking about the food? Or were you thinking about the spiritual food? Right? What were you thinking about when I said that right now? Be honest with yourself. Are your eyes on the lamb? Or are your eyes on the land? It's simple. It's as simple as that. And then you go to verse 7, right? Abel is accepted, right? And Cain is rejected, right? He's rejected. So you see, the one who is accepted shall rule over the sin. And the one who's rejected shall have the rule or the sin ruling over him. And if you read this passage carefully, you'll see that sin is characterized as an animal. The first time sin is, is characterized, law first mentioned in the Bible, is an animal laying at the door of your tent, ready to come in, and he has his eyes on you, ready to mark you up. And so that's what we see here in this first interaction between the good and the wicked. The result, the ugly truth is that Sinners will be marked. Sinners will be marked. And my friend, I know I'm preaching to a group of saved people. Be not dismayed, right? You, I mean, be not uh, deceived. You are a sinner still. You're a saved sinner. Saved sinner. You're still a sinner. And at the judgment seat of Christ, you, your sins will be shown. Your sins, and maybe not sins, but maybe bad works will be shown. Maybe I can't say sins exactly, but bad works will be shown and manifested. So you will be marked. We will know, oh man, you know, Brother Max was lying the whole time. He wasn't even buying those donuts. He was still in those donuts every morning, you know? We're going to know all those things are going to be manifested and we're going to know all that. And sinners will be marked. Sinners will be marked. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that also shall he reap. Right? So your sin will find you out and it's going to show. And, and, and one way it shows here, so we'll look at, we'll look at Cain's response. Um, to the, to the Lord, right? And so when Cain murders his brother and the Lord comes to him, where, where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not, am I my brother's keeper, right? So you see what he, he's trying to like, like pushing back against the Lord, right? Am I my brother's keeper, you know? Like, am I supposed to be the one in charge of him? You're God, you know where he's at, right? And so he's, he's getting kind of upset. And this continues on. When God gives him his punishment, he said, oh, that's, that's more than I can bear. The one who finds me, they're going to kill me. They're going to, right? And you see all this, you see all of this. And maybe us in our flesh, us with our, our eyes on the land lately, we see that as, oh, you know, he was just, he was a little down. He was a little pity party. You know, don't be so mean to him, Rob. Well, no, 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 because it doesn't matter what our feelings say. We all know it doesn't matter what you feel today. It matters what the word of God says. And in complete contradiction to this, if you go to Ezra 9.13, actually you don't have to go there, but if you're quick in your Bible, go to Ezra 9.13 and you'll see the complete opposite of this. So Israel, after living in sin for many years, after living in sin for many, many, many years, when God punishes them, Ezra pays a prayer and he says, And after all that has come upon us from our evil deeds and for our great trespass, seeing that thou, our God, hast punished us Less than our iniquities deserve and has given us such deliverance as this. 
You realize God didn't kill Cain. He didn't send straight Cain straight down to the lake of fire to start burning from day one. He let him, you know, maybe he marked him and he still went out and he was the first, you know, his children were the first to have cities and the first to do metal work. And a lot of things still came right from that. Right. But it's, that's that sounds good. That sounds like the Lord had a lot of grace. Right. A lot of grace and mercy. Right. A whole lot of grace and mercy. And still he was complaining. Oh, Oh, it's, it's more than I could bear. But you see here, no, the righteous, just as Ezra prayed, prayed, should understand, man, I deserve a whole lot more than that. I deserve a whole lot more than that. When I heard Brother Kelly the other day saying over and over, every day I wake up and I, I know I'm saved, but I, I know I deserve to go to hell. I deserve to go to the lake of fire. I deserve to be burning in the lake of fire. I deserve to be burning in hell. I deserve to be burning in the lowest hell. I deserve burning in the lowest hell again. And I'm, I'm, I'm repeating this because that's literally how he said it. And, you know, literally, I mean, I mean, if you know Brother Kelly a little bit, that's kind of how he talks. But also, you know, the repetition there is showing how real that is to him, you know. How real it, maybe we say, oh, I'm a sinner once. But unless you're crucifying yourself daily and putting that flesh on that cross daily, then that's going to be a little uncomfortable for you, right? And I see maybe it is a little uncomfortable for you right now. But the truth is, when, the, when if you're not the righteous and if you're not the wicked, then you're probably in that ugly truth. Right? You're probably somewhere getting in that ugly truth, right? So if you're not saved today, you're somewhere in there. And you need to decide. I, like, I know there's none good but God. I know that, right? I, we, we all know that. We've all read the Bible, right? Congratulations. But we also know that by believing in God, we're imputed His righteousness. Imputed, right, Jesus' own righteousness because He was the only one that's righteous. So He gives that to us, right? So do you want to step in those shoes? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And thine house, because I shouldn't forget that, right? <laughs> so uh, that's my first point, right? So who are you? Who are you? Second point, we'll go over here to 1 Samuel chapter 24. 1 Samuel chapter 24. And we'll just be looking at another instance of the good and the wicked meeting up and an ugly truth rearing its little face. So 1 Samuel chapter 24 and we'll look at verse 6. 1 Samuel chapter 24. And we'll look at verse 6. And the word of God says, And he said unto his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch forth mine hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. Do you know what's going on here? So, right? David had been hunted by Saul for many years. He had been almost killed, right? And when he gets the best opportunity to kill Saul, he puts his feelings away. We don't know how he felt. He doesn't even say it. Bless God. He doesn't even say how he felt. All that matters was that he should not put his hand against the Lord's anointed because that's what the Bible says, yeah. right? Yep. Right? So the first good king, David... Right? Because although he was the second king, he was the first good one. Right? So the first good king, he's going to be tested and corrected. Because he was tested here, he could have put forth his hand. And he didn't. And we know because of Revelation, we are made kings and priests by the Lord Jesus Christ. So are you going to be the first good king? Or are you going to be like Saul, the first wicked king? Which are you going to be like? Are you going to be the one that is despised when you're tested and corrected? Are you going to be that one that when you have that opportunity to put your hand against the Lord's anointed to say something bad about our leaders, maybe not even Pastor Kim, but just some other good Bible-believing people who are out there doing a, a soul-winning ministry? Maybe you don't agree with everything, that, everything they do, but that's not your... You know, that's not on us to go to their church or their ministry and tell them how to do it. If they're winning souls, hey, praise the Lord. Pray for them. Pray the Lord will correct them on their other things. And let's keep moving, right? Let's keep moving, right? And so 
Or are you going to be like Saul? Are you going to be the one that when you're, when you're corrected and when you're tested, you're constantly failing? When your man of God is late to come down the hill and you're like, where is he? He's a day late. Oh, I'm just going to bypass what the word of God says, even though Jesus Christ is the only king, prophet, priest. And I'm just going to bypass it and be my own priest. I'm just going to do the slaughter myself. I'm just going to do the prayer how I want to do it. Because that's what Saul did. And that's the first time he's rebuked by Samuel. That's what he does. He tries to do the sacrifice himself. And Samuel comes and he's like, what are you doing? What are you doing? But that's how, that's how the wicked they are. They like to be left unchecked. And although he got that little rebuke there, I'm sure it went in one ear and out the other. Just as it always was with Saul. You study Saul, he's always like, he's given a command by God, go kill Agag. What does he do? Comes back with Agag. Comes right back with Agag. Kills everyone else, leaves Agag. Then he gets upset with David. And he finds out, uh, uh, I, I believe, Abiathar, but one of, the, one of the priests gave food to David. And what does he do? He kills the priest and his family. You were scared to go kill a, a rotten king that God commanded you to do. But all of a sudden, when it's in your hand, right, when it's in your hand, all of a sudden you go and do the most, right? You put your hand against the Lord's anointed, right? So what are you doing? Who are you more like? Are you back talking to the pastor? Are you saying things behind his back? Are you murmuring against the Lord? Are you complaining about your brethren? What are you doing? Tested and corrected. You will also know in 1 Samuel chapter 24 and verses 26, you don't have to turn there. I'm just going to talk to you about this a little bit. But we know that David is tested so many times. So many times. He's on the run. And this is just before he's king. After he's king, it doesn't stop. And you know... Yea, and all who live godly in Jesus Christ shall face persecution. So, right, so this is beforehand, and when you, when you, after you get saved, you're still going to face persecution. You're going to have some, you're going to have the peace, though, right? So, you're going to have the peace that passes, passeth all understanding. So, it would be much better then. But even before, and even, actually, he's already anointed, so he is, he is the king already, right? Just as we are. Maybe we haven't got to that place where we won't ever sin again, but you're already a king and a priest, right? You, that's what the Bible says. You already are, right? You already are. And so you're going to also be corrected. Just like, when, um, just like when David was out and he was protecting people of certain lands, and then when Nabal didn't pay his price that he was supposed to pay to David for David doing the protection, right? And then David gets in his flesh and he's like, yo, let's go kill this guy. Right? So they go out and they go to go kill him. And then what happens? Abigail, Nabal's wife, comes and meets him. She comes and meets him. And this is one of the first times where David is truly corrected, where, you know, we see a man who is after God's own heart really get corrected, right? Really get corrected. And you might say, well, what, what do you mean? What do you mean, preacher? Well, I mean, if you remember the story, right, Abigail says, right, you've been so blessed. The Lord's going to make you king. We all know the Lord is going to make you king. And when you become king, don't let this little incident, don't let Nabal's blood be on your hand and don't let all, that other, all this stuff you're about to do ruin what God's already doing for you, right? By taking things into your own hand, don't do it. And so he's corrected there, right? And what does he do? He just, oh, yeah, yeah, you're right, Abigail, you know, and he, he listens to her. Maybe David, being a fleshy guy, maybe she was pretty. I don't know. He goes and marries her after. So maybe she was. I don't, I, I don't know, right? But the Bible just says that he listened, right? And so he took that correction. He took that correction, right? Just as we need to be so willing to take that correction where it's like, you know, sometimes, sometimes I'm almost too gullible, you know? Like some people, like one of the brethren will tell me something, and I'm just going to jump on it, and I'm going to say, yeah. But within a few days, I'm going to go back, and I'm going to search that up, you know? But, and, and so that, that's the type of like charity, right, we need to have with the brethren, right? Just like, hey, you know, I trust you, and, you know, I will, I will let that in. Of course, we need to go and search out the scriptures, see whether those things are so, like the Bereans, right? Yeah. But, but still, right, we need to have that, that charity and that trust between each other, right? And we need to be willing to take that correction, even if it is from one another, right? And so go back over to Saul, right? Saul left unchecked. Uh, how many times does he make a vow to God? And he doesn't do it. Do you remember when he vowed that if anyone ate any food, if anyone ate any food, that they would be killed? And I believe that's 1 Samuel chapter 14. And he says, if anyone will eat any food until we win the next battle, then they're going to be killed. And his own son goes and puts his rod in the honey and has a taste of the honey. And yet, after he says, I believe in verse 44, he says, 
today Jonathan will die, and then all of his people, no, no, not Jonathan, he's the best fighter, blah, blah, blah. And he listens to the people, forgetting that he had made that promise in the Lord's name. How many times have you said, oh, I, I swear to GD, you know? I swear, to, and I'm, I'm talking about your whole life. I understand maybe not since you're saved, but think about all the times your whole life you said that. I don't know about y'all, but I was wicked. I swear to GD once a week and twice on Tuesday, you know? Like, pff, all the time, all the time, you know? And like, how many things have we put on the Lord's name and we really deserve to, you know, pay for that. You know, we really do deserve to pay for that. I love how Samuel, or not Samuel, but David, when he's on the run from his son Absalom, uh, his son, one of the types of the Antichrist, he's on the run from him. And while he's on the run, um, I, one of the house of Saul, I believe, I forget his name, Sheba, maybe, uh, he's on a, another hilltop going parallel to them. So as David's kind of like a little upset with his people walking off, the other guy's on the other hilltop like, David, you suck. This is what you get. You know, yeah, you know, Saul's house is going to come back in. You know, that's what you get. Your son sucks, you know. Like he's, he's grilling them, you know. And then uh, the, the, some of David's more zealous men are like, let's go get him. Let's, let us go get him, David. Let's, this, he's not right. He's not right for doing that, for saying those things about you, right? And what does David say? You know, what am I to do with you? What am I to do with you, right? Talking to those, to those people that were saying that. He said, you know, uh, how do I know that God didn't put that on his heart to do that, you know, to tell me those things, you know? And maybe God will reward me for not putting my hand against him, right? For taking whatever it could have been there, right? And I just love how David reacted there because Lord knows I wouldn't have reacted that way. I don't know what you would have done. But I'm definitely more like that wicked king. I don't know if you could agree. I don't know if you're brave enough to say it, but I know I'm more like that wicked king, right? So just think about it. Are you the good king or the wicked king? And the ugly truth that comes here is when there's a good king and a wicked king, the wicked's house is going to be destroyed. The wicked's house is going to be destroyed. And we see this in two great types. We see this in two great types. First, the lost sinners, right? They're going to have this whole world and everything they love burn up and become nothing, right? And so I like to think about at the great white throne judgment, right, when, the, when death and hell and they cast up their dead and everyone's there, right? Well, right before that, literally right before that, the whole earth and everything is all burned up. And I like to have, I like to have a little in my mind, maybe the Lord will correct me when I get there, but that as they're all lining up for the great white throne judgment, they're seeing all their, all their, their precious earth burning up behind them. And right behind them, everything they had is all burning up. And they're finally repenting, as they should have, because we know that the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, but that all should come to repentance, right? So they're finally turning from the world and having to face that great judge that they spent their whole life turning from and, and hiding from and, being, and, and, and not willing to hear the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, right? Or not willing to even pick up His book and see what He had to say, right? And they're going to have to finally face that. But they're going to see their house destroyed. They're going to see everything they ever loved destroyed. And that's Revelation chapter 20, verse 9 through 11. And for, and, and for us Christians, we know at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the doctrine of the judgment seat of Christ, that at the very end of that whole spiel about the judgment seat of Christ, the good and the bad works, we're going to suffer loss if we have bad, bad works and things like that. Uh, at the very end of it, it says, uh, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God? And right, he who defiled the temple, him shall God destroy. Right, him shall God destroy, right? And, and so people who stand where we stand, we like to say, well, that's your life. That's your life here on this earth. Your soul is saved, right? This, the Holy Spirit within you is going to take you right up to heaven when you get saved. But that flesh of yours is not saved. And if that flesh is ruining the testimony of Jesus Christ, if you're out there cussing at your work every week, and the kid who God's been working on, the new hire at your work is hearing you cuss, and he knows you're a Christian, and all of a sudden all the, all the sewing and all the work people have been doing on that kid is gone. I don't want to be like a Christian. I don't want to be like a Christian. That's what, wow. If that's what Jesus, little Jesuses are like, Jesus wasn't a good man. Right? Because you understand Christians is little Christ. Yeah. Right? You understand what you're agreeing to. You're saying, yeah, I'm, I represent that guy. When you cuss. Right? When you have those dirty thoughts. Uh, so then we'll go over to 2 Samuel chapter 9. So not only is the house destroyed, but there are some things that you're not going to be able to do anymore. 
And maybe they're good things, but we'll see this. So 2 Samuel chapter 9 and verse 3. 2 Samuel chapter 9 and verse 3. And so the, uh, the Word of God says, And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show kindness, the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto, unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son, which is lame on his feet. So you see that right there? He's lame on his feet. The only one that survived this whole destruction of the wicked king's house is someone who's lame on his feet, right? And I know it's, it's a very beautiful thing, especially if you think about the fact that Jesus Christ said out of his own mouth that the, the um, how, how does he say this? Uh, they that are whole have no need of, of, of the physician. Keep that Right, of the physician, not a physician. Jesus Christ is the physician, right? Psalms 103, verse 2, baby. It is the Lord who forgiveth all thy iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who healeth all thy diseases. So he is the physician. He says, they that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So uh, the one good thing that comes out of this whole thing of, of the wicked being destroyed, the house of the wicked being destroyed, is that the only one that's left is the one who Jesus Christ, they, on, on that little gift, that gift of salvation, well, on that little, who's it to? It says sinner, sinner, lame on his feet. That's you, right? Because if you've ever studied feet in the Bible, not, not what you feel about feet and stuff like that, not what you've learned in the world about feet, but what the Bible says about feet, you'll find that feet are heavily connected with our works for God. And they're heavily connected with uh, God doing something. In fact, it's so, I have a little bit of time here, so I was hoping I'd have time because this is really, really cool. But um, if you go through the first ten references of the word feet, you kind of find a cool little picture. So the first four references are all about washing. The next three references are all about following commandments. The next two references are circumcision and Passover. And the final reference is the actual feet of God, where the, where the children of Israel, or Moses, I believe, one of them, go look this up yourself, right? Go, go home and study this. But they see the feet of God. Huh. Interesting. Interesting where those feet lead, right? You follow the feet, get to the feet of God. I don't know about you, but I'm going to cast my crown right at those feet. And I'm going to be right down there saying, hey, Lord of Lords, King of Kings, you didn't need to save me. And I want to kiss your big toe. I'm not, I'm not lying. I want to kiss that big toe. I'm, you know, so I'll be right there at those, at those glorious feet. And uh, another cool little thing, Psalms 119, the longest chapter in the Bible, it mentions feet only three times. And uh, I'll leave that up to you to go find that because you, I, I really believe you'll get a blessing out of that. If you see the one time, the longest chapter in the Bible, which speaks about itself, the Bible, how it talks about your feet and what they should be doing. But, uh, so more importantly, though, so uh, Psalms, I mean, uh, 2 Samuel 9, 3, we see that he's lame on his feet. Well, if you do study these feet a little bit, you'll find that feet of the wicked are quick to shed blood. The feet of the wicked are quick to shed blood, right? Huh. Who does that sound like? Someone who's quick to go murder some, a family of priests because they gave bread to his, you know, one of his enemies? Hmm, okay. Uh, the feet of the wicked are quick to run to evil. Hmm, hmm. Friday night and you want to skip your Bible study and you end up uh, in downtown San Jose? Hmm, okay, quick to run to evil. Huh. Quick to run to mischief, huh? Now you're not just in downtown San Jose. Now you're stumbling into, well, I mean, it's not just a bar. It's an arcade and a bar. You know, I'm not drinking. I'm just playing the arcade games. And, you know, oh, maybe I'll get a chance to witness to them. I know they're drunk, but, you know, maybe I'll get, you know, mischief. A little bit of mischief, right? Or are your feet quick to go there? Were you late to, were you late to soul winning this morning? Hmm. Were you? Hmm. I don't know. Quick to run to mischief. Quick. Very quick. And so, what are you? Who are you here? Are you quick to run to mischief? Are you quick to run to evil? Are you quick to shed blood? Are you quick to get angry at your brother and sister? Huh? Are you quick to come to church? Are you quick to tell someone about the gospel? Are you quick to, when you hear someone say, it's hotter than hell, to say, no, 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 it's not hotter than hell. Or I love, I love Dr. Ruckman. He says, you know, he said, someone, someone says, excuse me for this, but, you know, he says, like, uh, someone says, like, uh, you know, uh, 
well, I'll be damned, or, you know, something like that. And he's like, oh, no, you don't want to be damned, you know? You don't want to be damned, you know? You don't want that. You don't want that at all, you know? Like, like little, little things like that, right? Are you quick to pick up on those little witnesses, to, op- to uh, opportunities to witness? Or are you quick to tell a dirty joke? What are, you, what are you quick to do? I can't hit on every point, but I'm just trying to give some examples, right? Because we all have different lives, right? We all have different lives. I'm just in college, so I see a bunch of kids cursing and doing stuff like that. So those are the examples I'm using, you know? But I'm sure you have your own examples that the Lord can, is dealing with your heart, you know, about things you do, you know? So who are you? Are you the good king? Are you the wicked king? Or are you going to get your house destroyed? And luckily, if you're not saved, and your house is destroyed, you're the exact person that Jesus Christ came to save. So our, our third set of people, I guess I'll say, is going to be off Ezekiel 16. Ezekiel 16. I know this is a different type of sermon, and uh, I'm not quite Pastor Gene Kim, but I hope this is a blessing for you. I hope it is a blessing for you. And uh, Ezekiel chapter 16 and verse 6. So here we'll be getting over the first Christian nation typified in America, and we'll be using Jerusalem for that. Okay, so look, don't, don't, hark, don't I, you Bible believers, don't get me now. I'm not, I'm not, I knew IFV. I'm not trying to say, you know, America is Jerusalem. I'm not trying to say anything crazy. I'm just saying for the sake of this sermon, we're going to use Jerusalem as America. Since Jerusalem was the first, uh, you know, Jewish nation, first nation of you know, people who believe in God, and it just so happens that America is one of the first nations to be founded on Christian principles, right? And in fact, it is the first, the first nation to be founded on that. So we'll be going over America, the first Christian nation, Sodom, the first sinner nation, and what happens with these two here. So uh, Ezekiel 16 and verse 6, the Word of God says, And when I passed by thee, and saw thee polluted in thine own blood, I said unto thee, When thou wast in thy blood, live. Yea, I said unto thee, When thou wast in thy blood, live. We know this is a bloody nation, right? People that came over here, they came, why? Because of persecution. When they got here, they got taxed, started a war. Big, bloody nation, right? So we we were in our blood, but those people... Some of them had a Geneva, and some of them were standing on the truth. The King James Bible, right? Solid, right? So they were founded on the Bible, escaping persecution, escaping blood, right? And escaping all these things. And yet, as all this stuff is happening, as we're such a tiny nation, in our blood, God said, live. He said, live, become a nation. Stand up against one of the greatest countries in the world at that time, what? Uh, England or Britain, I don't, I don't know, whatever, wherever we came from. I'm an American. You know, you know, wherever we came from, you know, stand up against them, right? Come out of your blood and live. Come out of your blood and live. And, you, I mean, you also see this, what, I mean, just, just us, you know, like, the whole reason we're here as Bible believers is coming from the IFB movement, which is coming from the Southern Baptists, which is coming from the Baptists that came over into, right, from the 13 colonies, right, from Europe, right? So it's all kind of leading this way because of the American nation, right? Why we're actually here in this building, which is kind of crazy, right, being Baptist, that we have that, that whole thing there. Um, and then what happens, though, as we are blessed? I'm sure we all know this in our own life. When we're blessed, yeah, it's usually when we go away from God. And so at verse 15, you'll see here, and God says, But thou didst trust in thine own beauty, and plates the harlot because of thy renown, and poured out thy fornications on every one that passed by, as it was. Poured out his fornications on everyone that passed by. I think about, you know, I think about when I was lost and you passed by my house and you would smell, you would smell drugs and you would hear loud music, profanity. see people outside doing bad, wicked things, you know? And everyone that passed by our house would be somehow drawn into that. And I think about how many, just living in downtown San Jose, how many people would come by and they would end up getting involved in drugs and things like that, right? And we would 
put our fornications and these wicked things that we were doing in a household onto people passing by. I think, how do, how do we carry our houses? How do you carry your house? You know? We know the nation is going down, you know? We know that when we teach, we have trannies reading to children in school, and we have them learning about sexual things well before they need to know. We have all these bad things going on in elementary. Um, it's, you know, it's, it, I, I love how the Bible says not just Sodom, but Sodom and her daughters. And we'll get to that segment in a second. But, you know, we know that the nation's going down. But how are you carrying your own house? You know, how are you carrying when people come over your house? We got invited to the house of a Muslim today. And, uh, you know, he invited us in. And it was very, you know, courteous and stuff. Maybe it wasn't the cleanest house. But, hey, it was very nice of him, right? Very sweet to, to do that. And, you know, are you carrying your house when someone passes by your house? They, they're afraid to come in, you know? Are you, when, when they pass by your house, do they know it's a Christian home? You know? Do you have a bumper sticker? You know, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying, I'm just throwing it out. I'm just throwing it out, you know? Like, how, how hard are you working so that when people see you in your life and your house and your car and anything associated to you, how hard are you working in your life so that when people see that, they see Jesus Christ? How hard are you really working, right? Don't play me. Play the lottery. Gosh. Like, gosh, man, you know, like, I mean, we think about it. We're, we're in America where the most missionaries in the world are sent out of America, right? If you're not willing to go, at least throw five bucks extra for them or something, you know? Like, we're in the nation, of the, we're, we're in the nation that sends the most people out, right? Such a, a, a great opportunity we have to get onto the missions field. One-fourth of all missionaries in the world, this is 2012 at least, one fourth of them from America. That's a lot. That's a lot, right? That's a whole lot. And there's maybe one one hundredth of those are Bible believers. So there's a need for us to get out there. There's a need for us to be that first Christian nation. There's a need for us to be that Christian household, right? But more often than that, we carry ourselves as a sinner household. And America, you and I, we become more like Sodom. We become more like the sinners. We become more like the wicked king. We become more like the one that was of that wicked one. And, uh, you know, I mean, just as, just, as, just as, you know, Israel coming out of Egypt, they had the mixed multitude with them. We had a mixed multitude with us in our up upbringing. If you research America's roots, a good, no, a good number of them were Catholic. A good, a, a good majority were Catholic, right? So we had a lot of mix in there with. And so it's kind of natural where we ended up being more like Sodom. And now we'll go to verse 49 in Ezekiel 16, and we'll see where we're going and where our nation and our households are heading. And so in verse 49, the word of God says, Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom, pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy, and they were haughty, and committed abominations before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw good. You see what God did there? Took them away. We know what God did to Sodom. Destroyed it completely, right? And it, it's funny because Sodom is actually found in the land of Canaan, right? So a land that is not only the promised land, but if you know your Bible, after Ham's sin... Ham wasn't cursed. Canaan was cursed. So we see that back there, right? Even, even the own land, we could have went over the land, but even the land itself has this duality, right? And we see there's some that went towards the Lord, and there's some that followed all these mystery Babylon, and that's why, you know, nowadays, you, Judaism is how it is, you know? And in the days of Jesus, it was how it was, you know? There was even that duality there. And... The ugly truth there was that 
I mean, the nation of Israel has been cut off for 2,000 years now. You know? I mean, there's even an application for there. How long is God going to cut you off and put you on a shelf before He uses you, you know? How long are you going to be content with being on the shelf and getting dusty? I think about that old, uh, I mean, uh, forgive me for being worldly here, but uh, that old squeaky, that squeaky uh, toy on store, in, in store toy, yeah, where he's up on the shelf and he's, uh, uh, you know? And Woody goes up there, hang out with him. What? You know, don't watch it, but you know what I mean, you know? Think about that. You know, are you going to be that dusty Christian up on the shelf or... You know, what are you going to be content with? You know, what are you going to be content with? Or are you going to have pride? Are you going to have fullness of bread? Think about a sin of fullness of bread. The sin of fullness of bread. Right, when we came up here, and I was talking about the food, right? Well, you're full. Why was your mind on the bread? Why was your mind on the food? Right, you see what I mean? Like, why was your mind on the food when we're sitting in here and we're ready for the sermon and stuff? Like, but when you hear the food, you don't automatically think, oh, yeah, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Of course, of course he's talking about the bread. Of, you know, when I hear bread, I think Jesus Christ first. Oh, oh you mean, the, oh, you mean that, that, that squishy stuff? Oh, gotcha, that stuff, that stuff. I thought you were talking about the bread that came out of heaven, you know. Uh, I thought you were talking about that, uh, uh, you know. I mean, I'm not. I know, I'm. I'm. I'm really playing with you there. I'm not. I'm, you know. But. But do you see? Do you see where I'm? Where I'm leading you to? The. The type of mindset that I'm asking you to have, right? And I know it's not going to be overnight. It's going. It's. It's. It's just like our walk, right? Just. Just trying to have a little bit of a of a better mindset, right? A little bit of a better mindset toward this, so that we don't end up like Sodom, right? So that we don't end up having abundance of idleness. After we get nice and full, we have abundance of idleness. We have, right? Oh man. Man, so lucky, whatever, came here at 10 a.m., great soul winning, great service, Every second service was cool, some young guy went up there and walked around the stage for a while, yeah, you know, we're going to go home and chill, you know, I'm going to go home and kick it, you know, what, what are you going to go home and do, what are you going to go, oh, I need a nap, I need a nap, it's the Lord's day, but it's over, it's 5 o'clock, I know we're not Jewish, but 6 p.m. is the end of the Jewish day. I'm pretty much done, you know? Right? You see all the little ways we could justify it, right? When you know that. And, and that comes over to being haughty, right? That comes over to the next verse. And they were haughty. And they were haughty, right? That's one of the main things us Bible believers get accused of, right? Being prideful and haughty and just too like, oh, you know, I know the Bible. I know doctrine, you know? We, we get too much like that, right? We get we, way too much like that, right? And all of these are the sins of a sinner nation, the sins of Sodom. And the reason I'm calling it a sinner nation is because Genesis 13, 13, which is 13, the bad number in the Bible, twice, right? And it's the first time the word sinner comes up, and it's talking about Sodom, so that's why I'm calling it sinner nation, right? So who are you in this? Who are you? Are you the Christian nation or the sinner nation? Are you the Christian or are you the sinner? And the ugly truth of all of this is that sinners will be judged. Sinners will be judged. And all sinners will be judged, right? All sinners will be judged. And this is going for, uh, right, the, uh, us, us who, we will get the judgment seat of Christ, Right? The nations who are here in the tribulation will get the judgment of, well, at least their nations will, the judgment of nations, right? The sheeps and the goats, right? And then those who are lost will get the great white throne judgment, right? The great white throne judgment. That's where the books are open, right? And you get all the, the different judgments and stuff, right? So regardless, we're all going to get judged. We're all going to get judged. So, well, you know, I, I just want you to really, really think about it. When I get up there and, you know, because you, you think about... Um, Ephesians chapter 6, right? And, and you think about these great spiritual warfare passages, right? It talks about principalities, right? And if you look that word up, that's actually a region. That's actually a region of land, that word, right? It's actually, I mean, even like our government still uses principalities, you know, as an as a, a actual term, right? So are you going to be, like, are you going to be more identified with the American soil, the, the first Christian American soil, or the America that ended up more like Sodom? Or as we know what America actually is going to become, the leopard and a part of the beast system, right? So we know what they're already going to come. In the judgment of nations, my friend, America's out. I mean, if, if from what we know and from what most Bible believers have come to the consensus of knowing, 
about America's position in the beast, na the beast system, the judgment of nations, hey, they're done. They're in the beast system, brother. I mean, the, the beast is in the lake of fire in Genesis, uh, I mean, in uh, Revelation 20, you know. The beast and the false prophet are already there, and then Satan comes back down and joins them, you know. So they're already there, you know. There's, the, the America's not going to land, and then America's not going to be safe, you know. So what, what I'm asking you now it's gonna, America's already Sodom. America's becoming Sodom. If it's not Sodom now, it's going to be Sodom, right? So regardless, you're going to be standing in Sodom there, right? As, for a, as for, from a principality standpoint, you're standing in Sodom now, right? So who are you? Are you the one that stays there and gets burned up in the fire? Or are you the one that takes off with the family? Are you the one that loses everything and your life? Or are you the one that when you get away, you only lost the things that you deserve to lose? Right? Or, you know, maybe, maybe someone snuck out the back. Maybe, some, maybe there's some other guy we don't know about, you know? Because they were well under the number of, what was it, 10? Right? They were well under 10, the few that escaped. So maybe there one, was one other that got away unharmed or nothing. And I hope that's you. I hope that's you. I don't want you to suffer loss. Right? And we've got to think about how real that judgment seat of Christ is going to be when we get there. And people we should have done more for, we should have cared more for, we should have been more graceful with. We're going to have to look them. Look them in the eyes. And if they're not saved, we're going to have to be on the other side of that great white throne judgment and watch them go through that. So who are you going to be? How much are you going to lose? That's my sermon. Thank you very much. The good, the bad, and the ugly truth. Where are you? Who are you? Thank you. Uh, so I guess we'll just close here with a quick word of prayer. Um, not really too much of an altar call. I think we're already saved. So, uh, God, my Father, I just want to thank you, Lord, for uh, having that sermon to come out, Lord. Uh, I was so afraid before, Lord, and I just leaned on you, Lord, and I, I got something out of it, so I, I don't know what these people got out of it, Lord, but you, you preached at me, Father, so I pray that someone else got preached at too, Father, and just that my prayer for everyone here, Lord, is that they'll do better than me at the judgment seat of Christ, Lord, that each of these people here, Lord, that they'll get the amount of rewards that they're truly do. Not that their flesh is having them get now, Lord. Not that they're currently reaping, Lord, but all the gifts that you truly desire for them, Lord. I know you've set it up so some of our inheritance is uncorruptible, incorruptible. But some of our inheritance is corruptible. Some of our inheritance we can mess up, Lord. So I just pray now, Lord, that you would have grace and mercy on these people and you would light a fire in their bellies, Lord, and get them to have a better relationship with you, Lord, so you could lead them exactly where your will wants for each and every one of them, Lord. And just help us all, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone without works through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. 
I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that he can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what he did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great. Then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure. You could say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died, buried, and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you.